but um, the academic came out looking quite scared, so I think they want to hit me, it looks too complicated, but um, I think it's, with all the students, they've, they've taken something that when they first met it, it was de deliberately not breaking down for them like this, they've had to go away and do that themselves, and, and by the end of it, to come up with something as coherent as that, it's quite remarkable how yeah, they started. Right, on to our final group, so how do take it away? So our project was on finding a uniform mesh on a sphere. And the first thing we had to look at is actually what is a mesh. So a mesh is a grid or a set of cells, um, as you the cell on the left. And a uniform mesh is where all of these cells are the same size. So not only is the mesh on the left uh, a mesh, but it's also uniform. And we do actually have a method doing this at the moment. It's called the longitudinal latitudinal system. But the problem with this is uh, the cells get close, get much smaller towards the poles. Uh, so it's non-uniform, and this non-uniformity um, means that current weather predictions aren't very accurate. Uh, they're about as accurate as if you looked out the window and took an educated guess. Uh, and actually being able to form a uniform mesh around the sphere is essential for actually being able to get more precise and more accurate weather predictions. Uh, to look at why finding a uniform mesh on a sphere is so complicated, we first need to look at why there are very few, only five of that, perfect solutions to this problem. Um, now, what, now, another way of representing a mesh is by thinking of a set of points distributed evenly, so in the case of a uniform mesh. And so, first we would simplify it by looking at two dimensions. We would have to use a regular polygon inscribed inside a circle. This is because regular polygons are the only shapes with an equal distance between each of the points, making them uniform. Now, if we move into three dimensions, this problem will become more complicated. Because all the points must be the same distance apart in order to be perfectly uniform, which is what we want, by the same logic, the 3D shape must be made up of a combination of one of the same regular polygon. And also, this shape must be convex, with no holes or indents in order to properly represent a sphere. Um, and mathematically, what this means is the sum of the interior angles of the face that meets any vertex must be less than 360, which is clearly seen if you look at the net or the flattened versions of 3D shapes. Um, and, it, and if the angles were to add up to 360, as you can see, the shape would flatten out um, as, it, as, there is, as it could not fold into a 3D shape. And if the angles are added up to more than 360, the shape would uh, go on on itself and become concave. And there are only five combinations of regular <coughs> polygons which will allow for um, interior angles to add up to less than 360 degrees. Now, constructing these 3D shapes, we create what's known as the platonic solids, uh, named after Plato discovered in 360 BC. Uh, these are the only five ways of perfectly distributing points on a sphere, and uh, due to the small number of faces, they have little use in any, in any of the fields where a uniform mesh is actually needed. However, it is possible to manipulate the entire solids to make them a lot more uniform when you're projecting onto a sphere. As it's shown behind me, you can connect the midpoint of each edge of a platonic solid, and it will form a quadrilateral on that face. So uh, if you do this for, for every face on a solid, it quadruples the amount of faces. And these can then be projected onto a sphere, as is shown on your right, which looks a lot more uniform than if you were to just project the, project the original solid. Now, you can keep doing this loads and loads of times until you get something that looks a bit like this. Now, this suddenly looks a lot more uniform. Now, I've shown two of the platonic solids that David mentioned here, the cube and the icosahedron. Uh, as, seen, as is shown on the slightly less colourful version of the cube, you can still actually see the original edges of the cube if you look closely, which means the icosahedron is a lot more uniform and therefore part of uh, what we're trying to do. Another way of finding a higher definition mesh is if we consider the Thomson problem. Um, the first thing we need to look at with the Thomson problem is the idea of electrostatic potential energy. And that is the idea that one charge will, is the potential that one charge will exert a force upon another. So this can be considered a model with uh, magnets. So the idea that these magnets, in this case, which repel uh, the electrostatic potential energy would be the energy with which these magnets would repel each other with. And if we distribute these around the sphere with the least, so they act the least on each other, and therefore stay in the same positions, then that's the idea of the Thomson problem. So if we just replace them with electrons, and this is what the actual Thomson problem is, which is how to distribute n electrons around the sphere 
with the least electrostatic potential energy. And then if we take every point, every electron here, and we join them up as so their vertices of faces on a mesh, then we can create fairly uniform meshes. And the larger the amount of electrons we have on there, then the more complicated and the high definition the actual mesh gets. Yet, as is actually visible with the n equals 600 uh, mesh, you can see that it's not entirely uniform. So this is again not the it, not the correct solution to our problem. Now, a formal diagram is another way of creating a mesh, and it's less uniform than what we've seen so far. But it's very good for real life applications where you've got certain types that restrict how uniform your mesh can be. So it makes it so that each cell contains one site and any location within each cell is closer to that cell site than any other. For example, <coughs> the sites could be hospitals and these people could want to know which hospital is closest to them. So by adding a Voronoi diagram, you can see that the red man is closest to the hospital he shares a cell with. And the purple man, he's on a vertex of the Voronoi diagram, which means he's just as close to the three hospitals surrounding that vertex. Now, this is the simplest use of Voronoi diagrams, but the most practical for us, once we get to the mesh on the sphere, would be in predicting an unknown value for a location such as where the red man is, using known values at the site. This is very useful for things such as weather prediction in weather forecasting. So, a uh, Delaunay triangle prediction is the dual of the Voronoi diagram and can be created simply by connecting up adjacent sites on the Voronoi diagram to four triangles. And each of these can be simply applied to a sphere by making a straight line segments of a great circle, which is the circle you create when you cut a sphere in half. So although these are the most uniform meshes, they are very good for if you've got certain things which you are likely to have that restrict how uniform your mesh can be. Now, something that connects all of these is Euler's formula. Now, I can begin to the punch a little bit when talking about Euler, but he was an important mathematician and physicist who lived in the 18th century, who was vital in the development of geometry, especially topology. Now, his formula that applies to our project is on the screen behind me. F plus V is equal to E plus 2, where F is faces, V is vertices, and E is edges on a 3D shape. And this formula describes the relationship between these three on 3D shapes only. This relationship was originally described by René Descartes in the early 1600s before it was refined and proven by Euler, who published his findings in 1750. This was an extremely important discovery because it allows us to understand the structure and behaviour of DNA, which obviously helps us advance medicine, and also because it develops the field of topology, which is a part of maths where the properties of space are preserved, so you can squish and bend shapes as much as you like, but you can't cut or glue any of them, and this relates back to how meshes can be projected onto a sphere. Now there are several proofs of Euler's formula that are fairly long-winded, so I'm not going to go into them. But the one that Euler used was to break a 3D shape into its net and to triangulate the faces to show that his formula applies to them no matter how much you triangulate and how you treat it. Triangulation is essentially breaking a shape down into the triangles that it's made up of. Now, Euler proved that his formula is true for any 3D shape, which means that includes the platonic solids. And if it's true for the platonic solids, it must be true for any subdivision of them into a higher resolution mesh. And because of topology, what applies to the meshes in their platonic solid form can apply to the meshes on a sphere as well. So, to sum up, we now know that a good uniform mesh that's been projected on a sphere to predict weather has to have these qualities. It has to have edge length and cell area, which are pretty self-explanatory. They have to be equal in order for it to be uniform. But they also give us a way of quantifying how we partition the sphere's surface, and therefore they give us measurements that we can work from. <coughs> Nearest neighbor is what um, Tilly touched on. It's the idea that uh, a place in a cell can be, its weather can be predicted based on the cells in, but it can also, its weather can be predicted based on the cells near it, its neighbors. Um, so we've got lots of methods. We've got David and 
Patrick's platonic solids, Mike's Thompson problem, Tilly's Delaunay and Voronoi diagrams, and Ambler's use of the Euler's formula. And uh, well, I've waffled on, so you're probably wondering, what is the best solution? What's the answer? Well, um, there isn't one. <laughs> as far as we're concerned, you can find one that ticked every box. The methods either they sacrificed uniformity, i.e. accuracy, for um, practicality, or vice versa. Right, well, I'll uh, leave you with a joke. <laughs> knock, knock. Who's there? Don't mash. Don't mash who? Don't mash with us. <laughs> Merry Christmas. <laughs>